Welcome back to Pat Bar LSAT Prep. In this video, we continue our presentation of Section 4 of Prep Test 76. Question 19 presents the discovery by researchers of microdiamonds in Western Australia and calls them the oldest fragments of the Earth's crust that have thus far been identified. The passage says that these microdiamonds were formed more than 4 billion years ago and only 300 million years after the Earth was formed. And so their discovery tells us something about how long it took our planet's crust to form. You are to presume these facts to be true and find which answer, therefore, must also be true. When we recall that must also be true means the assumptions must fall apart if false, the correct answer quickly makes itself apparent. The passage dates the microdiamonds at 4.2 billion years old and assumes as correct that the Earth's crust formed 300 million years earlier. If we assume A to be false, that the Earth's crust did take longer to form than 300 million years, then the conclusion that the discovery sheds light on its formation falls apart. This must therefore be true, and A is correct. Question 20 offers as fact that the public square of olden days was used as a tool of democracy, since it allowed disparate opinions to be aired at a single gathering. It also presents as fact that the Internet presents to anyone with access the opportunity to discuss these issues with millions of other people and therefore allows the Internet to play the same role as the public square. The conclusion that Internet users must be given at least as much freedom of expression as participants in the public square. One of the answers to follow is required by that conclusion. The required assumption, of course, destroys the conclusion if it were not true. For example, if people didn't have complete freedom of expression, it doesn't harm any argument for at least as much. What if all citizens don't have the same level of access? Doesn't hurt the argument, since enough access to guarantee at least as much freedom of expression is all that is required. D makes absolutely no difference even if 99% of internet use was frivolous, as long as the other 1% gave everyone with important issues to discuss at least as much freedom to do so, the conclusion holds. What if some other form still available is an important tool of democracy? Does that hurt the conclusion that internet users should get at least as much freedom of expression? The answer is no. Only if we assume that a public forum Note the subtle change in phrase, by the way, not public square, and the Internet is a public forum only if we assume that it cannot be as effective without freedom of expression does the conclusion fall apart. This is the required assumption, and C is correct. Question 21 presents the results of an experiment at a large elementary school that the students who completed the program in which they learned to play chess did better afterward in all of their schoolwork. The conclusion drawn by the passage is that the reasoning power and spatial intuition learned by these students was of benefit in other intellectual activity. Of the five responses, you are to choose the one that would most strongly weaken that conclusion. Three of these possibilities are straight-up misdirection. The students who did not participate in the program are not presented in the passage or its conclusion in any way, regardless of whether they learned chess at home, they participated instead in other after-school study, or were already more talented at playing chess. B is tempting, but it too is a misdirection. The study is presented as showing increased achievement levels among the students who completed the program. Their levels before don't matter, only that they increased afterward. B does not weaken the conclusion. So why is C correct? If you're a student who completed the program and chose to join the chess team, which requires a high grade average, you have a separate incentive to get high grades. If this incentive was factored in, it could hurt the conclusion that the program was the reason for the increase. 
Question 21 provides an excellent example of the power of misdirection. You will face it, and you will use it, in law school and in court. Question 22 introduces us to Kate, who on Wednesdays usually buys some guava juice. We are told she can only buy it at the local health food store, and the passage postulates that she must sometimes shop at the local health food store on Wednesdays. One of the following answers most closely matches that reasoning. The phrasing will point you to the correct answer. X is usually true. Y must be true. Therefore, Z must sometimes be true. That eliminates B, which presents all are and all are. Therefore, all must. C, D, and E all present similar scenarios. Most plus all, therefore, sometimes. C says, most dinners come from the main kitchen, and all teachers can use the kitchen. Therefore, teachers must cook some of the dinners. D says, most teachers can use the kitchen, and all dinners come from the kitchen. Therefore, some must be prepared by teachers. E says, only the teachers can use the main kitchen, and the dinners are usually prepared by the teachers. Therefore, they must prepare some of the meals in that kitchen. All three of these options fail because they conclude with a logical flaw. There is no such flaw in the stimulus. A is the precise match. All are plus most are equals some must. The order is different, but the specifics are the same. Question 23 features an editorial piece on the city's recycling program. According to the editor, the city claims it is more cost-effective to pick up recyclables once a week than it was to collect every other week because it will collect more recyclables to sell. The editor says the overall volume won't change because people put out the same amount regardless of how often it's picked up. One of the options that follow would most weaken that argument if true. Here is another example of sticking to the argument and ignoring irrelevant details. The argument is people will put out the same amount of recyclables regardless of how often they are picked up. And the city's claim that this will make the new program more cost effective is rubbish. Pun intended. So, the cost of collection and disposal, the time it requires to collect, and the amount the contractor charges are completely irrelevant. The editor is arguing that the city's intent to be more cost-effective won't work. If the volume does go up and it still doesn't work, that would, if true, serve to strengthen the editor's argument. If, on the other hand, it is true that the new collection program makes it easier for people to follow, this raises the possibility that they would be more likely to take advantage of it which could mean more recyclables, supporting the city and weakening the editorial. D is correct. Question 24 presents a professor arguing that introductory science courses for undergraduate students are intended to be difficult to weed out those students who are not serious, except some of the least enthusiastic students pass anyway. And so, therefore, these classes are not serving their purpose. You are to find the one assumption required for the argument to work. Let's jump to E. To say we should stop doing something if it doesn't work is merely a possible conclusion of the argument that it doesn't work. This is clearly not a requirement. Same problem with B. To say let's fix it is a possible conclusion and nothing more. Remember the argument. The intent has failed because some of the least enthusiastic students pass anyway. Whether some of the most enthusiastic fail these courses is completely irrelevant. Neither A nor C is correct. If we assume the opposite of D, that some of the least enthusiastic students are among those most committed to being science majors, it would suggest that the courses are serving their purpose, collapsing the argument. D is required and is the correct response. Question 25 includes an essay on the hissing sound used by many species of birds and reptiles to ward off predators. 
it postulates that this similar action suggests a common ancestor, but notes that such an ancestor would have lived at a time when predators could not hear that hissing. Which answer then would most help to resolve that problem if it were true? If the ancestor couldn't hear itself hiss, it would tend to argue against its continuing evolution. If it used several means of protection, this too would suggest that the hiss might evolve away. If the ancestor had few predators, the hiss might not have evolved in the first place. The amount of energy used is irrelevant if the method doesn't work. Which leads to C. It is common for an animal to make itself seem as large as possible and therefore a greater threat to a potential predator. If making the hissing sound also increased one's size, that might prove effective and resolve our problem. C is correct. This concludes our presentation of Prep Test 76. In our next video, we will begin our presentation of Prep Test 77.